Now, if we're going to go back to the origin of the universe, nobody knows how it started, nobody knows what initiated the Big Bang. Physicists are working on it. Maybe they will discover what it was, and maybe they won't. But they've already got it down to the point where it's something very simple. If you suddenly smuggle in a creative intelligence at the origin of the universe, then what you have smuggled in is a complex entity, because an intelligence must be a complex entity, a complex entity of exactly the same kind of thing as we're trying to explain in the first place, as the end product of biological evolution. I think it's highly likely that in the universe there are complex intelligences so far advanced over ours that we would treat them as gods if we were ever to meet them. If we are ever visited by aliens from outer space, then we will bow our knee to them because they will be necessarily so far ahead of us in order to get here at all that they would seem like gods to us. But the important point is that they would not be gods in the sense that they just happened. They would have to have come about, come into existence as the end product of a long, gradual process of slow, cumulative, if not Darwinian evolution, then something equivalent. They had to have simple beginnings, because simple beginnings are easy to understand. Complex beginnings are not an explanation at all. Complexity is that which we're trying to explain in the first place. So I think that this, while this doesn't disprove the existence of any kind of God, it makes any kind of God of the creative kind, as opposed to the alien from outer space kind, any kind of God very, very, very improbable indeed. So you've got your arguments for, for why there almost certainly is no God. Of course, for a lot of people, religion is probably something, um, something of a comfort, um, something that gives them a sense of purpose in life and a sense of meaning in life, and something that actually helps to get them through. Why, why the campaign against it, Richard? Why, why be so hostile towards it? Is it not just something that's really a personal matter for people to, to pursue or not if they wish? I accept that some people get comfort from religion. And uh, I wouldn't wish to take away uh, the comfort of somebody, say, who's dying or who's bereaved, uh, something of that sort. Um, I would steadfastly resist, however, any suggestion that because it's comforting, therefore it's true. You'd be amazed how many people think that because something is consoling, it must be true. Or they, they might say, well, I mean, I just can't accept that when I die, I disappear. I mean, it would be intolerable if when I die, I disappear. Well, I'm afraid that something that's intolerable may just be true, just tough. Uh, you can't just magic something away because you wish it wasn't, it wasn't true. But you went on to ask why the campaign. Shouldn't be, people just be free to get on with their religion? Yes, they should, if they would leave the rest of us alone. Uh, and some of them, of course, do. <laughs> But when you think about, well, the most extreme examples, of course, are people who actually go to war for their religion. Uh, and it's, it wasn't over with the Crusades. I mean, we're, we're facing pro prospects of at least threats of jihad to this day. Uh, and we have suicide bombers in the name of Allah. Uh, and then within our own Christian society, we have Christian bigoted busybodies interfering with scientific research, trying to stop stem cell research, um, trying to interfere at every new stage in scientific research where it interferes with their precious Bronze Age myths. They will try to stop it. And with remarkably powerful political levers at their disposal. The House of Lords contains bishops, as of right, who sit in the House of Lords simply because they are bishops royal commissions on reproductive ethics will always have clergymen, rabbis, mullahs will automatically be invited onto these things as though they had any kind of 
expertise to offer rather than say serious moral philosophers or legal philosophers or scientists. We've got about five minutes left now, Richard. Um, so two last questions just to finish up with. The first one is, I'm quite in interested in, in the whole negative impression that people have of, of atheism and atheists. It seems that it's, it's kind of okay not to believe in God, but to be an atheist is just taking it that step too far. Um, why, why do you think that is? How do you account for that? The American, and what can we do about it? Yes, the American comedian Julia Sweeney uh, and announced to the press at some point that she'd become an atheist and she received a, a frantic telephone call from her mother and her mother said well not believing in God I could understand but an atheist <laughs> we do have horns and a tail don't we um, something about the way we're brought up uh, in, a, in the United States it is said that atheists are the most unpopular minority according to opinion polls. An atheist is just somebody who doesn't believe in, well, probably doesn't believe in the God you believe in. Um, but you, if you're a theist, don't believe in Thor, and you don't believe in Apollo, and you don't believe in Zeus, and you don't believe in Mithras, etc., uh, etc. Et I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of gods that none of us believe in. And so, what is so special about going one god further? Um, I don't believe in any gods. I'm very prepared to believe in a god if anybody will produce any evidence. But for exactly the same reason, I'm assuming there are no Vikings here or Olympians here, and exact, for exactly the same reason as you don't believe in Thor with his hammer, because you can't disprove Thor with his hammer, but nobody's ever given you any good reason to believe in Thor and his hammer. You don't believe in him. Similarly, I've never been given any good reason to believe in Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever else one wishes to call the God of the Jews, Christians and Muslims. So um, in, in all other respects, we atheists are decent, nice people, we're good people, some of us are bad people, some of us are good people, just as some Christians are bad. Some Christians are good. Um, we are just like any other person, except we happen to, to, th to feel about Yahweh the way everybody nowadays feels about Thor. Okay. <laughs> and finally, Richard, you fairly recently set up a charitable foundation, haven't you? Can you just tell us a little bit about that and, and what its aims are? It's called the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and it's two foundations, one in America and one in Britain. <coughs> And the idea is to educate and do research into reason and science, the rational view of the world, and combating irrational views of the world, including all forms of superstition, and that includes religion. Um, the reason there are two charities is that the tax laws in, in America and Britain are rather different, and so it's convenient to have two linked charities with the same trustees and the same aims so that um, it's easy to give money across the Atlantic either, either way. The most tangible um, the, um, result of the foundation so far has been the website that we run which is richarddawkins.net uh, and um, I encourage anybody who wants to go look at that. It's a fairly lively forum. It's actually how I met Paula because she's one of the um, most vigorous and, and eloquent uh, contributors to this, to this website. Um, so do go and, go and look up richarddawkins.net. Well, I can endorse that recommendation. <laughs> That's it. Richard, thank you very much indeed for talking to me thank today. You. Thank you.